Hello and welcome to Bay College's online lectures for college algebra. This is section 2.1 which deals with distance, midpoint, graphs, intercepts, and symmetry. It seems like a lot, um, but we're just going to touch on them. You should have some background in this at this level of math. This is college algebra. The first thing we're going to look at is the Cartesian coordinate system. This is just a way that we can use to uh, graph points that represent either an equation or the distance between two points, or maybe we want to find uh, what's the midpoint in between them. We're going to use the Cartesian coordinate system. The Cartesian coordinate system is essentially made of two number lines set at 90 degrees from each other. One we call the x-axis, and that is our horizontal axis, and the other one is the y-axis. In quadrant one, all the points that we can graph in here have an x value and a y value where the x value is positive and the y value is positive. That is the definition of quadrant one. Both our x and y are positive. In quadrant two, as we move counterclockwise here, our x values are negative and our y values are positive. Anything to the left of the y axis is a negative x value. Moving down to quadrant three, here, both the x and the y are negative values. Because we're to the left of the y, but we're below x. So these are both negative. Negative x values, negative y values. And then finally, in the fourth quadrant, our x values are positive, because we're to the right of the axis. And our uh, y values are negative, because we're below the x-axis. So this is our quadrant and, uh, of our Cartesian coordinate system. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to move over here. And we're going to look at distance. Uh, if we want to find the distance between two points, we can use something called the distance formula. And the distance formula isn't really anything new. You should be somewhat familiar with it. It is just a variation of Pythagorean theorem. At some point in your math career, you should have seen or come across Pythagorean theorem. So we're going to take a look at these two points. I have the point 1, 2 where x is the 1 and the y value is 2. We're in the first quadrant, so both are positive. And then we're down here in the third quadrant. Our second point is negative 3, negative 2. Maybe I want to find the distance between them. And I made reference to Pythagorean theorem, because if I want to find this distance between here and here, essentially what I have to do is say, how far over in x do I have to go, and how far up in y? If we think about it, I just made a 90 degree triangle. So this can be described using Pythagorean theorem. If we move over here, we can see c squared equals a squared plus b squared. That is Pythagorean theorem. Essentially, our a is our horizontal change from this point to this point. And our horizontal change can be described as the change in x, x2 minus x1, that quantity squared. And our y values is the change in y. How far up do I have to go to get from this point to that point? There is some change in y. So <clears throat> y2 minus y1, that's my change in y, that quantity squared. It just replaces b. Now, because this is squared, and we call it a distance, because distances are always positive, so we're not too concerned in that negative distance, because there's no such thing, really. It's just direction. So, to solve for this, we'd take the square root of both sides. So d equals the square root of the change in x squared plus the change in y squared. This is the same as that. It's just another way of expressing it. So let's find the distance between these two points. Well, my change in x, if I call this uh, point 1 and this point 2, just moving left to right, I can find the distance by saying the square root of x2 minus x1. 1 minus a negative 3, well, that'd be 1 plus 3, which is 4 squared. Plus the change in y, y2 minus y1, so that'd be 2 minus a negative 2. Well, 2 minus a negative 2 is 2 plus 2, which is 4, that quantity squared. So 4 squared is 16, plus 4 squared is 16. 16 plus 16 is? 32. And hopefully we remember, when we have radicals, we should simplify them. This is 16 twice, as we've seen, and 16 is a perfect square. The square root of 16 is 
4 times the square root of 2, that factor that I could not take the square root of. So this would be our distance between those two points. The distance from here to here, the length of this line, or our hypotenuse of our triangle, would be 4 square root of 2 units, whatever value that is. Now, what if we're interested in finding the midpoint of a line segment? What's the distance or the halfway point? And maybe that's not it. That's why we're going to find it algebraically. But what's the middle of this line, the midpoint? What's somewhere in between? Well, here's the midpoint formula. And honestly, I feel you do not have to memorize any new formulas. If you know Pythagorean, you can derive your distance formula. But this one here, this is essentially asking us, what is the average x and average y? If you know how to find an average, you just sum the values together and divide it by the number of values. That is the midpoint formula. I have two x values, so I'm going to sum them together. Negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2. Negative 2 over 2 points is going to be negative 1. And then to find the average y value, I just sum them together, negative 2 and positive 2 is 0, and 0 divided by 2 is 0. So negative 1, 0, actually this right here would be my midpoint. Negative 1 in the x, 0 in the y. I'm right on the x-axis. I don't go up any, I don't go down any. 0 in the y direction. So this is my midpoint, and I can label that point negative 1, 0. Make sure when you're asked to label points in college algebra, you actually write it as an ordered pair, because that's how we uh, describe ordered pairs on a Cartesian coordinate system. We have to label them with an x value and a y value. All right, let's move on and look at how uh, graphs of these equations uh, work on a coordinate system. The first thing we're going to do is let's just take, for example, y equals x squared minus 1. Here we have a parabola. Hopefully we Recognize that as a parabola. If not, you will throughout the semester. We have a question here. Is x equal to 2 and y equal to 3 a solution? Well, we can check it simply by putting it in. If y is 3, I can say 3 equals this value here, which says x squared minus 1. Well, x is 2, so I replace the x term with a 2 minus 1. Now let's just see, is this a true statement? If it is, that makes this a solution to this equation. Well, 2 squared is 4. 4 minus 1 is, in fact, 3. 3 equals 3 is a true statement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a table of values. 2, when it goes into this equation, for the x value, we get a y value of 3. Those were the values given. x is 2, y is 3. Well, what if I chose more points? What if I said, what if x is 1? Well, 1 squared is 1, minus 1 is 0, y would be 0. If I say x is 0, I can plug in that value. 0 squared is 0. 0 minus 1 is still negative 1. y equals negative 1. And I can continue on in the negative direction as well. These values were positive, and now we're going into the negative. If I put in negative 1, I still get 0. If I put in negative 2, well, negative 2 squared is still positive 4. Minus 1 is still 3. So here's a question. How many solutions does this equation have? Well, if we think about this table, if I continue in the positive direction, I'm going to find y values. If I continue in the negative value, I'm still going to find y values. Essentially, this has infinite solutions. So how can we describe an equation that has infinite solutions? Well, one way is by graphing it on a Cartesian coordinate system. If we go over to this graph here, let's start plotting some points. Uh, 2, 3, so that means positive 2 in the x, up 3 in the y. And then I have 1, 0, so when y is 1, or excuse me, when x is 1, y is 0. When x is 0, which is right on the y-axis, y is negative 1, so we notice it's right on the y-axis because the x value is 0. And we have negative 1, 0. When x is negative 1, y is 0. And finally, negative 2 for x, positive 3 for y. Negative 2, positive 3. And if we continued to do that, we'd see a pattern, and hopefully we already see a pattern. If we're familiar with parabolas, we know that they have 
this shape. This is the parabolic shape. And I put these arrows on here to indicate that that would continue on forever. As x gets larger, y also gets larger. As x goes into the negative direction, y also gets larger. So let's define a few points on this graph by going over here. If, we're, if we want to know where it crosses or touches the x-axis, essentially what we're asking for is, what is the value of the y-axis? Or excuse me, the x-axis. What is the y value at the x-axis? Well, the y value is always 0 at the x-axis, because we're not going up any or down any. We're at 0 in the y. Now, if we ask that question, essentially what we're looking for is the x-intercept. To find the x-intercept, we essentially set y equal to 0. And if we go back to our equation and set y equal to 0, x squared minus 1 equals 0, we find that x can equal plus or minus 1 when y equals 0. So let's look at this here. This value here, we have two x-intercepts where the y value is 0. It crosses at 1 and negative 1 when y is 0. So negative 1 and 1 when y is 0. These are called the x-intercepts. Where does it cross or touch the y-axis? Well, if we go back to the graph, we can see the value right here. Well, what is the x value? Well, the x value is 0 because we are right on the y-axis. And if we plug 0 in for x, 0 squared is 0 minus 1 is negative 1. We'd have a y value of negative 1. And if we look at the graph, sure enough, it crosses the y-axis where y is negative 1. This is called the y-intercept. Now, to find any of the intercepts, you always set the other variable to 0. If I want to find the x-intercept, I set y to 0. If I want to find the y-intercept, I set x to 0. All right, so here's your quiz. Using the example y equals x squared minus 1, I want you to find the intercepts algebraically. Actually plug in 0 and prove that this is true. And I want you to show your work. All right, so that's your quiz. Do that for yourself. Make sure you show your work. All right, moving over here, we're going to talk about symmetry. For this equation, y equals x squared minus 1, it does have some symmetry. And what is symmetry? Well, we're actually looking relative to some axis or the origin. Are there points on one side that are mirror images of the points on the other side relative to an axis? Well, y symmetry means that what's on the right side of y is also on the left side of y. Talking in terms of ordered pairs, the y value is the same, but the x values, one's positive and one's negative, of equal distance from y, from the y-axis. And we can find these values, which we'll see in an example coming up. If I have a function, if I put in a negative value of x and get out the same value of y had I put in a positive value of x, we can see that this is symmetric with the y. In this example, let's actually do that. If I put in a negative value of x, what happens when I square a, a negative? It becomes positive. So essentially, y doesn't change. Its value is the same as the original function. So it doesn't matter if x is positive or x is negative. We will get the same result. That means, algebraically, this is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Well, we can also have symmetry with respect to the x-axis. If I replace y with a negative y value, I get the same x value out. Now, this wouldn't be symmetric with that, because whenever I square this negative, y is actually gonna, uh, not going to change. So the signs won't change. Okay? So this would not have y symmetry, or x symmetry, excuse me. And uh, finally, Origin, symmetry through the origin. If we review the Cartesian coordinate system for a moment, symmetry through the origin means if there's a point up here that's positive and positive because it's in the first quadrant, we have that exact same point mirrored where it's negative, negative. 
Okay, so this point is mirrored, but it's mirrored through the origin, our value 0, 0. And hopefully we remember that's the origin. How can we test if something's symmetric through the origin? Well, if I have some function with x, y values, if I put in a negative x value, I get out a negative y value. Both signs change if I put in a negative. And that tells me that it's symmetric through the origin. So we're going to go back to the other end of the board here. And we're going to look at testing for symmetry. How do we do this? Well, if we look at this function, to test for x symmetry, I'm going to put in a negative y value. So to test for symmetry, I put in a negative of the opposite. So I have x equals negative y squared instead of just y squared. Now, what happens when I square this negative? I get x equals y squared. This is the original function. If that happens, it means we are symmetric with respect to the x axis. So we have symmetry with respect to x. If I wanted to test for y symmetry, well, I replace x with a negative x. Is this the same function? There's no simplifying I can do here. Is this the same function that I started with? No, this is not. So there is no symmetry with respect to y. Finally, to test for symmetry through the origin, I replace negative x and negative y. And then we do some simplifying. Well, if I square a negative, I get negative x equals positive y squared. Is that the same as the original function? No. So it is not symmetric through the origin. Now, we didn't actually have to test all three of these. If it's symmetric with one, it will not be symmetric with another. It's one or another. So not both. So we see, yep, it was symmetric with the x, because when we replaced the y, we got the original function back out. Let's do it again, but let's look at this example. We have y equals x cubed. Let's test for x symmetry. If I put in negative y, because I'm testing for x symmetry, I replace the y value. Is there any simplifying I can do there? Not really. So does this give result in the original equation? No. It is not symmetric with x. Well, let's test and see if it's symmetric with y. If I put in a negative x value and then do a little simplifying, what happens when I cube a negative? Well, I get y equals negative x cubed. When you cube a negative, it stays negative. Is that the same as the original function? No. So that tells me it is not symmetric with y. Finally, let's test symmetry through the origin. If I put in a negative y value and a negative x value, and then I do some simplifying, well, negative x cubed is negative x cubed. And there's yet some more simplifying I can do. If both sides are negative, I can factor out a negative one, or divide through by a negative one, or multiply through by a negative one. And I get y equals x cubed. This is the same function I started with, y equals x cubed. We can see, yes, there is symmetry with respect to the origin. Now, let's just go back for a moment, and I'm going to graph this real quick. This is the graph of x equals y squared. And we can see what's above the x-axis is mirrored below the x-axis. So this is symmetric with respect to the x-axis. If we look at this function, I'll just graph it real quick, it looks like this. Which means for every value up here in the first quadrant, plus 1, plus 1, or plus plus in our first quadrant, both values are positive, we have a value down here mirrored through the origin that's negative, negative. So if I put in a negative, I get out a negative. If I put in its equivalent value but positive, I get the equivalent value of x that's positive. So this would be symmetric through the origin. So that has been section 2.1. Thank you for watching.